Hello, family members. Hope you're doing better than I am today. <laughs> Bar's pretty low for you there. <laughs> um, I wanted to circle back and talk about something um, that came up in my comments section after my uh, fat representation video. And I wanted to explain something that seems to be a point of confusion, which is the actual purpose of representation. Because I think that people kind of get it backwards a lot of the time when they, you know, people who are against representation or don't understand it, they get it kind of backwards. So there's a guy who calls himself a comedian, <laughs> right wing guy, and he got real mad after uh, Black Panther came out because everyone was talking about how wonderful it was to have representation of a black superhero. And his way of responding to that was to like go on Twitter and, and put out sarcastic tweets about how the, there was no one he could relate to in the movie because no one was white. And I think that what he was thinking, the way that he saw it, was that people want representation of people who look like them and are like them so that they have someone they can relate to in a, in a piece of work. And that's not right. Because, you know, marginalized people have to relate to people in works of fiction that aren't like them, like, all the time, you know? It's not that that we can't relate to people who aren't like us. It's that marginalized groups never get the opportunity to see ourselves represented at all. And that's the problem. It's not that a character who isn't like me is, is impossible for me to relate to. It's that it feels very discrediting and invalidating to never see yourself reflected in your media, in your broader society. It's, it's more insidious than that, you know? It's not something that one movie or TV show can fix, you know? Because it's important for people to see all different types of people in the media they consume, both for their own benefit and for others' benefit. I think that, that one of the things that really upsets me is, is how, in, how invisible people with uh, disabilities are made to be in the society. Um, a while back, I, I discussed this too. I, I saw a meme where they were talking about um, what you would say to your child if they said something like, what's wrong with that kid? And pointed to a disabled kid uh, in public. How would you react? And it's like, that's so dystopian to me that a child that, was, that would be old enough to vocalize that thought wouldn't have been exposed to enough different type of people and seen disabled people enough to know that some people are disabled and that's fine, you know? And that's the importance. It's important for people to see me, people like me, people not like me, people like themselves, people not like themselves because it makes it a lot easier for you to relate to someone from a marginalized group if you have some sort of point of reference for them, you know? Like, 
for example, I've never met anyone from Laos. Never. Uh, at least not that I am aware of. However, if I were to meet a Laotian person, I would have some sort of frame of reference because of King of the Hill. You know? Because there's a family on that show. They're from Laos. And, you know, that's just who they are. It's just part of their story. And and that representation is enriching to me, even though it doesn't make them easier to relate to as characters. It's not about relating to the characters individually. It's about being able to relate to characters occasionally and for other people to get to see points of view outside of their own, you know? We, I also, I also got, you know, like, well, people want to look at sexy people. So, of course, they're going to put sexy people in movies and stuff like that. And it's like, that, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, like, not all entertainment is enhanced by having beautiful people. I mean, look at, look at. Uh, Nicole Kidman's fake nose that she had to put on to, to get her Oscar or uh, all they had to do to make Charlize Theron look like Eileen Warnos or, you know, how dressed down uh, Halle Berry was for her uh, uh, <coughs> in Monster's Ball, you know, like in order to make these extraordinarily beautiful people look like they could be part of a realistic story. You almost have to taint that beauty, right? And so it's like, why not just have like real people in our stories? You know, why not have people of all different body types and all different skin colors and all different backgrounds and all different la levels of abilities of different things? You know, short people, tall people, Instead of having any sort of representation like that be like side characters or people in the background, you know, the main characters are usually able-bodied and thin and male and white. And that is not representative of our society. Some stories should still be about people like that. But some stories should be about people that are not like that. That's what it's about. It's not about taking away. It's not about saying that it's bad for uh, people's story to be told. Everybody's story should be told. You know, that's the point. And, and I just, I, I think it would be really beneficial for society if they did see you know, people with visible disabilities just casually included in, you know, their media. And it's not like a big deal, you know? Like, that's what they talk about with queer representation, right? A lot is they'll talk about how, like, a lot of times it, in early days of queer representation, being queer was, like, the most important thing about the character. It was maybe even the thing that drove the plot, you know? And there was a lot about, like, suffering and stuff. And now we're learning to have representation that includes queer joy. And that includes, you know, people just living their lives who just happen to be queer, right? We need that for disabled people and overweight people and um, people of all races and backgrounds and and. If we had that, then when people encounter people who are different than them, they will feel less foreign, you know? Like, if you're not used to hanging around people with Down syndrome, the first time that you're around someone with Down syndrome, you might be like, oh, what, what's going on here, you know? But if you're like me and you were raised around uh, people who were... Uh, and disabled of all types because my parents both worked with disabled children and my dad's job was uh, you know profoundly mentally impaired teacher and uh, 
teacher of profoundly mentally impaired children, I guess I should say. But, um, you know, for me, uh, I can see the, like a person as a person first and whether or not they have a visible disability because I am used to interacting with people with visible disabilities, you know? And if we, if we interact with people of a lot of different types of being, it makes us better humans because we're able to see the, the needs and the wants of people outside of our immediate community so much better. You know, uh, I, I've learned a lot about Uganda because I have a neighbor who lives from, in, you know, was live, who was from Uganda, you know? I've learned a lot about Zimbabwe because my second family is from Zimbabwe. I've learned a lot about Japan because I had friends in college from Japan. You know, like, exposure breeds f familiarity and familiarity brings friendliness, kindness, community, you know? I, I, uh, I learned so much from watching YouTube videos about uh, the younger generations, you know, <laughs> the, all the stuff that they're into, because a lot of the creators on YouTube are going to be significantly younger than me. You know, I'm 42 years old. That's just the way it is. You know, that's, I'm not going to be the median age on, on this. And so being in, uh, in uh, watching so much YouTube, I've basically become exposed to people that I never really got a chance to, to know. Because you know, they were in high school when I was in my like degenerate college days, you know, drinking and partying and going to rock shows and stuff, right? So we, we were not living the same kind of life. And so it's, it's, it makes it a lot easier if I were to meet somebody who had those same cultural touchstones, it'd be easier for me to befriend them. And I just think that when people think about representation, they feel like marginalized people are saying, we can't relate to the white man. <laughs> and that's not it. It's, it's, our problem is that white men need to learn how to relate to us <laughs> and it, and that it's very affirming and you feel less alone when you see people who look like you, when you hear the stories of people who have stories similar to yours. And I just, I think it's a shame that we get the conversation about representation gets derailed because people don't understand the point of it is not to uh, denigrate any of, of any individual piece of art that's been made thus far in the world and, and say that there's something unrelatable about their characters. It's just about cr trying to create a better body of art that serves all of society equally because you know, we deserve that. I mean, in the United States, more than half of the adults are considered overweight. How often do you see overweight people as characters, main characters in anything? It's not that common. It should be at least half of the time, but it's not like that. Women are roughly half the population, but if you look at it, speaking roles in movies are almost all men, you know? And statistically, if you look at all of this, it just adds up over time, and it allows people to think that there might be something wrong with somebody because they're different when that's, there's nothing wrong with being different it's just different so uh, Soxy decided it's time for cuddles <laughs> oh are you a good boy oh my goodness are you being so sweet all right I better play with him who wants to play and cuddle 
don't you bow there. <laughs> He's like, don't love me so hard, mama. He loves it and he doesn't. <laughs> Take care of yourself, family members. I'll talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> oh,